And um, thank you for joining. Let's uh, thank God for the gift of learning Torah together. Baruch atah Adonai Elohim Olam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Amim Tanlanu Et Torah To Baruch atah Adonai Notein Hatorah. So today we are doing FDR and some text that when I sent the text out to you. Uh, the Jewish lens was from Lord Jonathan Sachs. Little did I know at the time that I sent it to you that he would pass away the next day. I sent this thing out, I think, on Friday, and Jonathan Sachs passed away quite young. He was 72 on Shabbos, and he was late to his eternal rest on Sunday. So uh, his, his words are very powerful, and it also feels really good to be able to study his Torah during the week of uh, his Shiva. But first, FDR. So let me just invite people's comments on FDR and what you thought about what you thought about FDR, the, the chapter on FDR. And what what were what did you find interesting about it? What did you take away from it? Um, thoughts and comments. Anybody? Um, well, I'll start it this way. Um, this is in a this is a very cheery piece of her book where she's talking about all four presidents suffered from depression. And um, two weeks ago we saw Lincoln's depression from the fact that he felt that his time as a legislator had failed and he was dirt poor and he didn't feel like he could marry Mary Todd and he was stuck in a rut. Then you had Teddy Roosevelt losing his mother, losing his wife on the same day. FDR's was different because he was just cut down in the prime of life by polio. And the, his, his source of depression was, was health that was personal, and it had a direct impact literally on how he lived his life every day, what he could do every day. If you remember her portrayal, she was able to capture the day before he got polio, right? You remember the day before he got polio, he has a young son and they're running and he challenges him, run here, run there and run afterwards. And he's just all energy and apparently pretty graceful and very strong and very athletic and full of energy and full of youth and young kids and young married and energy. And let's go run into this and run into that and jump into the cold water and run, run, run. And then he can't move. And then he's never able to walk. So what struck you about uh, what struck you about his response? We talked last week about, you know, Theodore Roosevelt's response to his depression caused by the death of his mother and his aunt was to throw himself into activity, busy himself with activity. What would you say was the secret sauce of FDR's response? to this sudden attack of his health. Uh, Harriet. Well, he had tremendous hope and optimism. And she, may, she gives a number of examples on page um, 162. She talks about his irrepressible optimism and 163, his, he radiated warmth and hope. And then when he went to Warm Springs, he developed a new empathy for other people who were suffering from a similar uh, situation. And he imbued them also with their, his optimistic spirit. So to me, it seems oh. that apropos Jonathan Sachs's um, piece that you sent out together with um, Abraham, uh, with um, Franklin Roosevelt. You're looking for optimism. Yes. So, by the way, if everyone can mute, if you're not the speaker, so that we don't hear ambient noise, if everyone can mute, thank you. Um, so, right. So, um, Harry, in your response, you taught you you use both the the words hope and optimism. Um, and I had always thought that they were synonymous. And the, you know, the Torah angle that we're going to share from uh, the late Rabbi Sachs is that hope and optimism 
we tend to use them synonymously, but he, he draws a very meaningful distinction, which we will we'll get to. Um, right, so, he, so, you, so we'll just call this now the spirit of, of FDR's hope and optimism. And um, one thing I want to say about it is there were still times when, when it felt like he had to summon that hope and optimism every day because you know there, there's the, the scene of him not being able to get up until the middle of the day and kind of being down and depressed, et cetera. Um, so it, it felt like it was a continuous work in, in uh, progress for, for him. Uh, what were other thoughts about FDR's, um, the FDR chapter, David? David Copeland. Uh, well, he, he was willing to, ex uh, dealing with his illness in particular, he was willing to experiment with different therapies and try one therapy. If that didn't work, he switched to another therapy. And that became a uh, prototype for his the politics. Uh, unlike Hoover, who got trapped into one line of thinking and, and, and got rigid, uh, FDR was, uh, had a lot of agility, uh, mental agility, that if something didn't work, uh, he'd abandon it and try something else. If that didn't work, he'd abandon it. Uh, and uh, that agility started with his hope for a cure, which never developed or a remedy, but at least it got him thinking into uh, hopping from one remedy to another remedy to another remedy. And that uh, probably served him well in his political career. Yeah, so you know, he's very famous for the statement that what the American people want is bold and persistent experimentation. Right, bold and persistent experimentation, and if you know, try it, and if it doesn't work, admit it frankly, and and try something else. And you're absolutely right that he tried that with himself, and then he was able to extrapolate that to the nation as he was trying to figure out what to do with the depression and the New Deal, etc. Um, but this idea of persistent experimentation became a driving theme of his life and then of his leadership as, as president. Uh, John. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, he also had an ambition. He had a goal that he wanted to work through, which I'm sure helped him be persistent. And he had something that not everybody has, which is great support system. Uh, he had people who would both be his legs and also who would support him continuing to drive forward. And that I think is very important. Yeah, it, it felt like one of his adaptive responses to his physical limitations was an advanced ability to work with people and to collaborate and to build long lasting teams. Just as you say, and, the, and that teamwork kind of uh, stayed with him, those, those teammates stayed with him throughout his life. And in some ways that were very intense, right? There are a couple of those members, Lewis Howe or others who actually left their families and, and lived with him. So something about him inspired loyalty that was very deep. So you see a, a you, saw, you have his physical malady and it would be so easy to just walk around with a chip on your shoulder that in the middle of, you know, in the, in the full bloom of your life, when you've got young kids and a young wife and you're running and jumping and swimming and full of energy, you get struck, struck with polio and you could imagine somebody just being angry, angry, angry and bitter and instead try things with all the persistent experimentation, collaborate teammates. Uh, and then of course, what he does with Warm Spring and becoming Doc Roosevelt, um, so he just create, and the irony is that, of course, you can't tell FDR's life without the polio, but one of the possibilities that the chapter leaves you with is that not only did the polio not slow him down, but perhaps the polio facilitated and enabled him to become the president because it made him, the story was not some rich guy from New York, a coastal elite to use an anachronism for the 30s, but the story was 
was the person who had tremendous courage when he makes the announcement for Al Smith at that convention in 28, he becomes the star of the show. Like how much courage? So who knows? So, so he's able to uh, transform what could have been so debilitating and he makes it uh, something that actually propels him um, and adapts in all those ways. Other thoughts, comments about FDR and what you took away from this chapter. And then we're gonna get to this all important uh, point about hope and optimism according to Rabbi Sachs. Any other, any other points? I have a, uh, please, Paul. Paul, you're muted. Yes. Um, I'm going to relate a uh, personal story. In my uh, 20s and 30s, I had a friend who developed polio. And the treatment at the time was for him to be, was bed rest. That's all he did. He was in bed all the time. But he developed a will that was just unbelievable. And he went through the physical exercises that was the treatment of choice at that time. And he learned to walk on crutches uh, with braces. He then got a driver's license and he had hand controls put in his car. He was in an automobile accident, got beaten up terribly and was in a cast for one full year. His physicians told him, you'll never walk again. That man in another year was driving a car again. Mm -hmm. So it's a testament to willpower that certain people have and is so indescribable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me, thank you for that, Sir Paul. I, here's a question that I would like to uh, either have you answer or marinate on which is what do you take away from the FDR story of how he overcame polio to become a four-time elected president? What do you take from that story that is helpful to you and that is applicable to you? So I just wanna kind of maybe invite you to marinate on that story and then maybe we can come back to that at the end with hope and optimism. Um, I want to ask you just one other question. It's not at all part of the, the reading from Doris Kearns Goodwin, but we bring ourselves to these books and we bring our own life experience and our own prejudices to the book. And I, so I just wanted to surface a question that comes up with FDR, because from a Jewish point of view, his story is a very mixed story. If you read Eric Larson's The Beast in the Garden, which is about the Roosevelt presidency and Hitler, his administration was filled with Jew hatred. I mean, this is deep. This is the kind of Jew hatred that where his advisors thought that the Jews had it coming to them. They didn't quite like Hitler, but whatever Hitler wanted to do to those Jews, the Jews had it coming to them. And, you know, Roosevelt famously wouldn't bomb the tracks, famously would not see rabbis who came to him, Erev Yom Kippur, hundreds of rabbis came to see FDR, Erev Yom Kippur to talk about the murder of Eastern European Jews and Roosevelt would not see them. And so another question I wanted to just invite you to marinate on or to respond to is what do you do with that as we're talking about fdr you know and in many ways a role model of resilience and strength and positive energy and you know doris kern's good one clearly and for very good reason uh has a lot of admiration for her for him and by the way um my I have a dear friend who is a quite published author, Roger Lowenstein, and he's in financial fields uh, for the most part. But Roger's, I've had a dialogue with Roger on this subject of FDR for 15 years. And Roger's point is, yes, he didn't bomb the tracks. 
And yes, he did not see the rabbis. And yes, he did not care for Jews. And yes, his administration was filled with Jew hatred. And FDR saved the world from Hitler. And FDR got America ready for the war. And, um, you know, it took a very isolationist country and got them fully invested in World War II. So I just want to, I, I just wanted to, to name that and surface that. Um, and before we leave FDR, if not today, before we leave him at the end of this book, um, we should, I'd also like us to, to reflect on that because that's part of the fullness of this person. So um, I wanted, what I want to do now is, uh, the, so it seems like the main secret sauce of FDR to deal with his depression and his polio was his optimistic attitude or his hopeful attitude, right? Um, his warm, genial smile, his sense that everything was going to be okay. And so what I wanted to do is to read uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs's piece on hope versus optimism, okay? Um, so uh, take a look at, this is um, just, it's a recurring theme in a lot of his books. Um, but I'll, I'll read it from To Heal a Fractured World. And he says the same thing in different ways in, in, in all, these little all these little passages. Um, optimism and hope are not the same. Optimism is the belief that the world is changing for the better. Hope is the belief that together we can make the world better. Optimism is a passive virtue, hope an active one. It needs no courage to be an optimist, but it takes a great deal of courage to hope. The Hebrew Bible is not an optimistic book. It is, however, one of the great literatures of hope, right? Uh, so Rabbi Sachs's distinction is an optimism is about feeling that things are going to work out. And hope is doing, doing deeds that make things better. And that the Jewish people are a people of hope. Um, that's Hatikva is not the optimism, it's the hope because we do stuff. So before we, um, you know, look at, at that distinction as it applies to a famous biblical story, I wanted to ask you what you thought about that distinction. Had you ever thought about that before, the difference between hope and optimism? And uh, is that new to you? And what do you think of Rabbi Sachs's distinction? And is it a helpful distinction to you? So. Uh, feel free to uh, chime in if you wish. Anyone? Uh, Barbara. Well, I don't think so because I can hope that someone wins an election and I, so I can write postcards. Other people can hope that they win the election and do nothing. So there is something that you can do. Some hope, I don't think, means you'll take up something. It's still optimistic. I think to some extent. Okay, but do you see a difference, Barbara, between kind of merely wishing for a result, merely wishing for a certain kind of outcome, and actually taking action that promotes that outcome? I think it's too narrow. I think it's too, I think you can hope for a lot of things in this world and take no action. Um, so I don't agree with that. I think it, you, you it sounds a little better, but um, I don't think so. Okay, so but before I leave you, his point is, and, and I think this is where the rubber hits the road, and I think this is a spiritual challenge here for us, that merely hoping for a result A, B, or C, I really hope A, B, or C happens. And to put it in religious terms, I'm gonna pray for A, B, and C, right? that does not get you anywhere, right? It might make you feel better, but when you just say, uh, A, I, you know, I really hope for A, B, and C, that doesn't make A, B, and C more likely. And when you say, and when you pray, oh God, please make A, B, and C uh, happen, uh, also doesn't necessarily make it happen. But his, his, his whole point is 
what are you doing to promote it? And that that is the Jew, that, that's his assertion, that that's what Jewish hope is. Jewish hope is not just a yearning from the heart. It's a yearning from the heart that motivates the hands to do. And that is what changes the world. So that is, and about, so at, when you think about FDR, what's interesting is that he didn't just hope for a cure, you know, he created Warm Springs. So he took what was there and he, and he, he invested in, all, in it and brought the best care and, you know, invested but, in, in helping. But without us. his optimistic outlook, I don't think he would have done that quite the same way. And right. I don't think, I just wanted to say he's also with some of the black marks too, along with the, what happened during the war. I think he had a limited upbringing, which we don't have as much. I think he was very close to a couple of Jews, Rosenman or someone who came to look, live with him too. And then also the fact that he went on for four terms um, and we had to change the constitution for that. Um, and he did make some mistakes at the end. So he was always hopeful and optimistic, but sometimes you have to be a little more wise. Mm. Thank you, Barbara. Other thoughts on, um, on this distinction and this distinction as it applies to FDR. Dottie. And Dottie, if you can please unmute. If you can unmute Dottie. I'm unmuted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're perfect. Oh, thank you. No, I just got through reading a book about Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt. And Winston Churchill, hope, I think, is helped by circumstances and time, basically, in your heart. Now, Winston Churchill begged President Roosevelt when they were being bombed. Eric Lawson wrote the book, um, 57 consecutive nights that Hitler, that they were doing the bombing anyway, and he needed more bo books, more boats. <clears throat> and Franklin Roosevelt would not get involved. He did not, we, we were actually isolated from all this until Pearl Harbor. When that happened, President Roosevelt did lend lease and he gave England the boats and everything else. He pushed it through. So the hope that the English people, and they were really were suffering, they were going to be off the face of the earth if, it, they, if America, if President Roosevelt didn't help them. But I think sometimes between prayer and hope and determination, but he did it in a nice way. Winston Churchill was a man for the time. President Roosevelt, when he came in, became the hero of the time because he did this to help the, well, to help the world is what it is. But I think that the determination, the prayer is number one and determination. And he, Franklin Roosevelt, was the perfect example of determination. And in that book that we're reading by Doris Goodwin, when he gets up to make the speech, He's got 20 pound braces on each foot. Everybody, they cheered. There were 12,000 people at the Madison Square Gardens, how determined he was. He right. got over to the podium and with his hands, he grabbed the, the uh, table. Right. And that was it. That showed the inner hope that he had, his determination. Right. And that, right. that's. So Yes. So, a, a, yes, that exactly. In other words, it was the sense that there would be a good outcome and he worked at it and, you know, and Doris Kearns Goodwin talks about how much he practiced in order to be able to walk and he didn't leave anything for, to, for granted and he didn't, uh, he planned it meticulously and he would walk with his son James and, right, so it was an attitude plus action. Um, okay, what I want to do is I want to think out loud with you about this this question of hope versus optimism um, with the famous story uh, that in many ways is the story that is the foundational story for the Jewish people. And it certainly is the story that gives the Jewish people our mandate. And I think that this distinction of hope and optimism um, as Rabbi Sachs defines it, uh, finds its way in this story. So 
Uh, actually, it's uh, from the reading from last week's portion. It's the famous story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So I'm on now the handout, which is uh, from our Chumash, page 102. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with verse 17. Now the Lord had said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Since Abraham is to become a great and populous nation and all the nations of the earth are to bless themselves by him. For I have singled him out that he may instruct his children and his posterity to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right in order that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Now, that is one of the most important uh, verses in all the Torah. It's verse 19, and it gives the Jewish people our mandate, which is la'asot, sadaka umishpat, to do justice and righteousness. La'asot, sadaka umishpat, to do justice and righteousness um, with an emphasis on doing it, okay? And now Abraham is given this mandate by God. And then God says to him, then the Lord said, um, the outrage of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grave. I'm gonna go down to see whether they have acted altogether according to the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will take note. Verse 22, the men went on from there to Sodom while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham came forward and said, will you sweep away the innocent along with the guilty? What if there should be 50 innocent within the city? Will you wipe out the place and not forgive it for the sake of the innocent who are in it? And then verse 25, famous verse, Khalila lacha, God forbid, far be it from you to do such a thing to bring death upon the innocent as well as the guilty so that the innocent and guilty fare alike, far be it from you. Uh, he's talking to God and he says, Khalil Lacha twice. And then at the end, Hashafet Kol Haaretz Lo Yaaseh Mishpat. Shall the judge of the entire world not judge justly? Now, uh, there's a lot to unpack in that, but you'll note that the, the main reason I bring it to you now in this conversation about hope and optimism is that Abraham is, is taking direct action. He's not praying to God. He's not hoping for a result. Uh, he is you know, arguing feverishly with the creator of the world to try to get the result that he thinks is the just result. And so, and what you see is that is the fulfillment of his charge. His charge is to do justice and mercy, to do justice and righteousness, and you see him trying to argue for this. Will not the judge of the world judge justly? So that hope, according to uh, both the Jonathan Sachs dichotomy and this story is about action. It's not a yearning, it's action. What are you doing? What are you doing that is gonna make this a better world? Let me pause. Thoughts, comments, and questions about, about this story. Any uh, any questions about it or thoughts? So I have a question. I'll, I'll ask you a question then. Um, this is the same Abraham and it's the same portion where Abraham then goes and, um, and offers Isaac as a burnt offering, or is prepared to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. And when God says to him, offer up your son as a burnt offering, he does not argue with God. He doesn't say, how could you possibly command that of me? And not only that, but since Abraham is so committed to justice and righteousness, one might think that he would also think about not only his son, but also his wife, Sarah, his, his son's mother, who, uh, to whom Isaac was everything. So how do you understand this Abraham, who, who argues to save criminals with the Abraham who in the next chapter is fine with sacrificing his son and does not consult with his wife. 
How do you understand that? And what does that, what does that inconsistency suggest to you? Any, anybody? Do, uh, do you know people who are really good with the world, but they're not quite so good with their family? I mean, this seems to be an abject case of a person who is really good with the world and does not see his own wife and does not see his own son. He sees, he cares about, you know, Nelson Mandela's daughter said he was so busy being the father of a nation, he wasn't my father, right? And you have a little bit of that here. Abraham is so busy being Abraham that he doesn't see his own kid and he doesn't see his own wife. That's a little bit of what's going on here as well. Zelda, your hand is up. And Zelda, if you could please unmute. Okay. So Thank that, you so much, Zelda. So I think that, um, and you put it that way, that maybe the story that we, not the story, but what we read about Teddy Roosevelt, certainly um, he, he didn't pay much attention to his family uh, when his wife died and his child was sick, and, but he went off and did what he did in the Wild West. And, and I think throughout his life, he probably um, was that way. He gave, he gave, he put his family aside for what he wanted to do in, 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 uh, in the world. Yeah. That's definitely very Teddy Roosevelt, right? You know, if there's uh, if the nation is at war, he goes off to the Rough Riders even though his wife and son were both compromised. And even though he wasn't drafted, he wasn't 18, they told him not to do it, he still did it, right? So I think that, I think Teddy Roosevelt is a perfect example of somebody who's really good with the world and maybe not so good with his own family. By the way, there was, I don't know much about this other than what she wrote, but apparently, you know, FDR, and Eleanor Roosevelt started as a real love affair, and then and then he had some extracurricular business going on, and then uh, with this Lucy Mercer, whoever that is, and then their marriage became more of a you know social justice partnership than a marriage. Um, so it's another example of uh, how easy it is to be one way to the world and a different way to the people closest to you and your own family. But I think Abraham is definitely that story uh, here with, with he's so noble here and so not noble with the binding. Other, other reads on, on this uh, story of, of Abraham and Isaac. Um, Let me, um, what, is it, what does it convey to you, before we get back to the FDR and, and close the class, about our ability to share our disquiet with God? Um, because this story is, is famous also for Abraham challenging God. And it's kind of, um, it's the, a role model and it's a template of what you're supposed to do as a Jew. You're supposed to challenge God. You're supposed to not be uh, docile. You're supposed to be a voice of protest. Um, what is, uh, talk to me about that aspect of the story. And does it uh, enable you as a person in 2020 with a very complicated world to, um, to share some of your concerns with God in your prayer life. Uh, I'd love some wisdom from you guys. It seems to be a very quiet class today. Uh, is there some, is there, am I missing something? Okay. Well, um, thank you for the class. Uh, next week, um, we're on, um, 
Lyndon Johnson, which is a, um, it's just an interesting, divert, interesting last piece of the depression puzzle, because it feels like one of these things is not like the other. I mean, Abraham Lincoln was dirt poor and felt he had failed as a legislator and he couldn't get married. And T Teddy Roosevelt loses his wife and his mother and FDR has polio and can't walk. By the way, one last thing about FDR before we close the class is there's a certain pathos to the fact that he never gives up on the idea of walking and he never is able to walk. It's like, it's very Moses in the promised land, right? In other words, he, at least as she, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin portrays it, uh, Ab uh, FDR never gives up on the idea that he is gonna walk again. He's gonna figure this out, he's gonna walk again and he never walks again. Um, uh, but that, but, but then my point for next week is LBJ, and, and this is the one piece of the depression puzzle that doesn't really fit. He loses a senatorial election, which is a disappointment, but hardly seems like it's at the same level of losing your physical health, losing your ability to walk, losing your mother, losing your wife, having no money to, to support yourself. Um, and yet, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin is going to argue that for LBJ, the depression that ensued from his losing his senatorial race was absolutely a devastating depression and would shape him in, in many ways. So we will pick uh, that up for next week. Yes, Marilyn. Marilyn Kalis. Uh, my comment has uh, is, doesn't go along with what you've been say, uh, uh, highlighting, but I, I took um, I, I looked at Eleanor Roosevelt when and and how she was able to forgive and forget when she tended to him, um, catheterizing him when he lay in bed doing all that, that's what Doris Curran Goodwin implicated that she gave of herself totally. And that is a woman of valor mm -hmm. because yeah, she, yeah. she had been heartbroken when she discovered the letters that, that he had uh, written to Lucy Mercer and realized that the, you know, this woman who was her social secretary had been having an affair with her husband. Yeah. yeah. Um, does um, that make you think less of FDR? Not really. <laughs> Um, what you're thinking, Marilyn? I think he was such a complex individual that um, I, 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 I have mixed feelings about how he treated her. But in the end, I think that they came to a, an understanding between each other that they were able to form a remarkable partnership. And, um, you know, she would not be the person that she became if, if not for the fact that he contracted polio. Right. right. Nor would she have had the impact she had on justice issues if she weren't married to the president. Yeah. As well. Paul? Yeah, on the uh, talking to God issue, this is extremely difficult to, uh, to uh, verbalize. But there is so many bad, there are so many things that are untold going on in this world that many people feel what is the point of thinking you're talking to a spirit or a God or whatever you want to call it that's going to change anything. And this, resu this results in people looking upon their religious experience as a wonderful social experience with other people, but not necessarily with a deity, because that deity doesn't seem to respond 
to the particular person's needs. Yeah, so, so Paul, how else can you interpret prayer? I mean, if you interpret prayer as you're going to throw up words to God about the world is broken in X, Y, or Z fashion, God, please fix the world in X, Y, or Z fashion, and you offer up the words, um, I can pretty much guarantee you that will have zero impact on the deity. Yes. I pray every morning and every night. Yes. If you say, God, X is broken, fix X, I'll spot you this. Zero impact. Zero impact on the deity. Right? You could pray, and Paul, I'll, I'll, throw, I'll, 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 add, I'll add to this. You could be shaking with sincerity. You could be crying and weeping with sincerity. And you could be 100% right. You could be 1,000% right. And it could be not about you. You're talking about somebody else. So it's selfless, passionate, impassioned, and just. And you're jumping up and down. God, God, God. And it will have zero impact. Zero impact on the deity. Let's stipulate to that. Now, here's my question. How else do you understand that project? And why else would you do it? Praying? Yeah. Well, the, the, the praying becomes, in my view, self-sustaining for yourself. Okay. And in other words, even if there is no God, even if there is none, saying, saying some of these prayers in the presence of other people helps sustain you in your own life. So it's very worthwhile, even though you know the likelihood of change is very low. Well, the likelihood of change from the deity is very low. Right, right. right. And for yourself, oh, for yourself, it can be remarkable. Uh, exactly. You know, yeah, right. I've, been reading, way, I've been yeah. reading. I've been reading. I've been reading Rabbi uh, Sachs. Sachs's book, and I am so taken by it because he says in print what I think and cannot verbalize. And just the other day, I was talking with my daughter, Cheryl, about sex. And the next day, he's gone. I felt, a, I felt a personal loss. Yes. I mean, I just thought he was remarkable. Yeah. Is, is remarkable. Yes. By the way, the book um, that, that we're studying, you know, Wednesday night, we're, we're doing the next installment of Morality. He wrote this book with his last strength. Yeah. You know, that he, he presented himself to the public to, on a CJP event, the Federation event, in mid-September. It was a Sunday for all these federations. And then that was pretty much his last public appearance in October. He withdrew from public life. Yeah. He was dead on November the 7th at the age of 72. Yeah. So very young. Yeah. So, very young. So, so I, I just want to... I just want to name and honor your instinct that if, if you think the point of prayer is, um, this is the Harold Kushner term, cosmic vending machine, that God is a cosmic vending machine, that you're going to put enough quarters in the cosmic vending machine and, and, then, and then that will start ka-ching, 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 and you'll get your, your, your prayers answered. That is, it, that is not happening, and it has never happened. But if you recast prayer, not as cosmic vending machine, but as you getting, uh, you know, your self strength, you giving yourself clarity, and especially in communal prayer, back when in the day when we could do communal prayer, um, that we give each other strength, and we give each other clarity, and we and you know, chazak chazak benit chazek, let us be strong, let us be strong, let us strengthen each other. That is very powerful. Yeah. So, right, so that's very powerful. And by, and by the way, I think Abraham here, I think the reason we read it is to inspire us to do what Abraham did and to do it for each other and to do it with each other. And if we could all do that for each other and with each other, then that is very powerful. Yes. You, you um, certainly you certainly verbalized it better than I could. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I appreciated the uh, I appreciated your your point and your and your healthy skepticism. Um, 
how, by the way, what does it do to your faith? Does it change your faith, Paul, and anybody? That somebody who was as good and righteous and mm -hmm. religious and observant as Jonathan Sachs dies at the age of 72 from cancer and goes like that. What does that have any impact on your faith? No, it really doesn't. Because I know things have things just happen that are beyond our control, that are beyond any person's control. Right. And dying is part of living. And as sad as I was I am about it. There's nothing I can do about it. And I am basically a hopeful optimist. I can't stand you. Okay. Um, any, any uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Marilyn. Any last <laughs> thoughts on, um, on life in the wake of, you know, the FDR chapter, the Abraham reading, and, um, and this reading from Jonathan Sachs, uh, who, we're in the middle of his of his shiva week. Uh, David Kopelman and then Barbara. Well, uh, uh, just to follow up on, on what Paul said and, and what you said is that uh, you have a man uh, of a wonderful uh, uh, Jewish background, a Jewish leader, uh, uh, promoting good in the world and dies at age 72. And you have a uh, mafia don who dies at age 95, surrounded by his family. Where's the justice? And uh, uh, as Paul said, I think things, uh, things happen randomly. There is no divine intervention. And one of the problems I've always had with some of the biblical stories is that they're filled with stories of divine intervention, like God parting the Red Sea to let the Israelites uh, leave Egypt. God keeping the sun in the sky an extra 24 hours so that the Jews could win a battle. All these miracles of, that show God, uh, God's intervention and, and also the message, a lot of the message in the prayers of Yom Kippur and so on, God, God shall uplift the righteous and punish the wicked. It doesn't seem to be happening in real life. Uh, the classic example, of course, is the Holocaust. Right. Uh, all those righteous Jews uh, being murdered. And no intervention, no intervention. So it's, uh, it's always been problematic for me reading the, the difference between God's intervention in the Old Testament yeah. and passivity in real life. Yeah. Um, thank you, David. Um, I have, we have a few minutes left. Um, can you handle an honest conversation? So, um, so I'm just being honest with you. Last night was Kristallnacht. And I really wanted to give the following Dvar Torah, which I didn't give. I wanted to give the following Dvar Torah. And, and this Dvar Torah was just like burning in me. Here's what I wanted to say. What I wanted to say is uh, Kristallnacht was 72 years ago. And, uh, 82 years ago, and 82 years later, what is the resonance of Kristallnacht? And here's the resonance for me, just speaking for myself. Adolf Hitler said, Jews are vermin. And then he said, Jews should be exterminated. And because he forged an emotional connection with his audience and his followers, they said, okay, he said, Jews are vermin. I guess they're vermin. And he said, Jews should be exterminated. I guess that means they should be exterminated. And he formed this connection. And as a result of an authoritarian perspective where there was no exposition of truth, an entire society went mad and they killed Jews as vermin. And what I wanted to say is that is happening now that when the president says there's fraud and there's no fraud, that is like Hitler saying the Jews are vermin when they're not vermin. And when listeners just say, well, he said they're vermin, so they're vermin. And listeners say, he said there's fraud, so there's fraud. That should just make Jews on Kristallnacht like it's a five alarm fire. This is a five alarm fire. 
we have seen what happens when an authoritarian strongman makes assertions that are not factual and his listeners and his audience and his crowd don't engage it because he's their Fuhrer. And we see what happens. What happens is that broken glass becomes six million. And I'm just telling you, I am super scared about what's happening in our society today. Because the, at the resonance of Kristallnacht is you have a strong man making assertions. There was fraud when there was no fraud. And instead of the world jumping up and down saying you're subverting democracy, his, his 48% followers and his the re enablers in the Republican Senate with the exception of four senators and with the exception of President George W. Bush, they are all acting towards his baseless assertions the way Nazis acted towards Hitler's baseless assertions. I'm just telling you that it's Kristallnacht and the five alarm fire as a Jew with any awareness of Jewish history should just be ringing off the charts. Now I wanted to make that to Vartora last night but um, but my 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 colleague said I couldn't do it and I shouldn't do it and but that that's that's really what I feel. I feel that there's a direct equivalency between Jews are vermin and there was fraud. They're both baseless and you have two societies that are accepting baseless assertions because of an emotional connection to the Fuhrer. And it's like seriously alarming, seriously alarming. I just had to get that off my chest. Anyway, guys, I will see you next week. We're on to uh, Lyndon Johnson. Thank you.